sun is setting. The sky is perfectly clear. That is Venus out there. And there's our moon right up there. We should be able to start imaging shortly. Shadow and I have come up the canyon. It's about midnight. It's cold, so we have a roaring fire to sit by. Shadow's out running around somewhere, but I'll show him to you. He has a down coat on underneath his coyote vest to keep him safe from predators. And he's out having fun. I'm tracking him. He doesn't get that he doesn't go that far away. He's about 90 feet though, and that's far enough. I'll send him a signal and get him to come back. We're up here because we're imaging the cosmos. And the object that we're going after tonight is a really unique object. It's called NGC 1333. I'll tell you a little bit about it while we're sitting by the fire, and I think I hear Shadow. There he is. Come here, Shadow. Come here, buddy. Good boy. Come here. Come on. Come here. Come here. Come here. Show everybody your beautiful green down coat and your coyote vest. I don't get any respect. <laughs> NGC 1333, also known as the Embryo Nebula. And that's because it is a star nursery. It's a dense, thick, cloud of molecular space dust and gases, otherwise known as a nebula. And deep within that, new stars are being born. And these are really young stars, no older than a million years, or a million years or younger. Now, a million year old star, that might sound like an old star, but a million years in the life of a star is very, very young. Usually, when these new stars are being born inside these nebulae, they'll hollow out like a donut. You know, the stellar winds are pushing up against the, the nebulosity and, and forming a, you know, like a hole, like a donut. But in this case, the cloud is so thick that it's obscuring the bright new stars. Just some of the light is able to make its way out through the cloud. Now there are some nearby stars as well. I'm getting engulfed in a cloud of smoke. <laughs> There's some nearby stars as well that are bright. And the light from those stars is being reflected by the nebula. And that is what we call a reflections nebula. So this nebula is reflecting the light from nearby bright stars and then some of the light from the hot new stars deep inside of it is making its way out. And the combination of the two gives it a really unique appearance, very colorful. And I should have, oh, about maybe 50 minutes on the target by now. Why don't we go take a look and see how it's coming along. And then in the morning, I'll show you this beautiful canyon that we're in, and hopefully the image. We're going to go over here now and take a look and see how this image is coming along. Turn off the light. Here we go. Now you're looking at a GoPro imaging a computer monitor. This will look much better when I've properly processed it and can show it to you. But I can tell you, I'm thrilled with what I see. I see blues and reds and oranges, and I, I can see 
that thick, dense clouds of the molecular space dust that make up the, the nebulae. This is just really coming along very, very nicely. I'm very, very happy with it. So I'm going to capture as much time as I possibly can. You can see here the telescope. It's pointed almost straight up into the sky. So it's directly above us. Pretty soon we're going to do what's called a meridian flip. Yeah, I'm very, very excited about this. So let's go back by the fire. Camping here, you can see, I got my camper. And I'm staying warm right here. And pretty soon after I do the meridian flip, we're gonna go to bed. And I'll wake up in the morning, I'll show you Ooh, smoke's getting in my eyes. I'll show you the uh, rig, where we're imaging with, the canyon, and then the image. How you doing, little buddy? How are you doing? You got dirt on your nose. You've been digging a hole. Well, good morning. Shadow and I have been up twice. We got up at 5 a.m. to shut the rig down, and then went back to bed and then uh, just got up here at about 8.30. But I wanted to show you this beautiful campground. I've camped here before. I have imaged from here before. This is one of my favorite places to come. It is such a geologic wonder. Layers of sandstone, different uh, colors and you've got limestone layered in there and then it was followed by volcanic activity so you've got this black volcanic rock intermixed with all of this beautiful red and then you got the sagebrush and the green brush going on it's just beautiful so we camped here last night. We've got the fire going again. Also, I found a couple, three, of what are called Moki marbles. They're natural iron secretions that form within the sandstone. And then as it, the sandstone erodes, they roll down. You can find them now. I think you're supposed to leave them, and I will. I just wanted to show it to you. There's another one right there. Moki marbles. They're called... That one broken. But, yeah. You find them up this canyon. So let me show you what we were imaging with last night. I brought up the big beast. This is the Orion XT-10. It's 1,200 millimeter focal length and 245, if I remember, 245 millimeter aperture. Uh, it says right here, 254, sorry, 254 millimeter aperture, making it a an f4.7 that's very fast i imaged with the now out of business sadly orion a g24 which is the equivalent to the asi zwo mc 2400 pro if i said that right full full uh frame color cmos camera uh, and captured with sharp cap and I was very, very happy with how everything was going. I got a, uh, I got probably about an hour and a half of imaging time on the target before I had to do a meridian flip. Got uh, back on the target just perfectly and went to imaging, went to bed. I did something, though, 
I can't believe I did it. But you know, there's so many things, so many variables that come into imaging. You got different systems going and so many things can go wrong. So when you make a stupid error like this, the table, I didn't pay attention to where my table was located. And through the night, as the scope slewed to track the target, the bar there that holds the weights, the counterbalance weights, snagged on this table and it prevented it from moving further. Now that's bad for two reasons. The biggest reason is the scope continues, the mount continues to try to move and it's very hard on the mount and it went for about three hours that way. So I've got my fingers crossed that the mount isn't damaged. I don't think it is because it's not the first time it's happened to me. Uh, not It is with the table, but I've had other things. Uh, sometimes the legs of the tripods and uh, different things, you know, in early days um, as I was learning. And it seemed to survive. So I'm hoping and praying that it did this time as well. The second reason it's not good is I lost that imaging time and when I got off to get up, when I got up to turn off the mount, it was still dark. It was still great. You know, the clouds were still clear and gone. The skies were clear. Now they, they've rolled in here. But I lost some good, valuable imaging time. But I did get another uh, couple of hours on it before that happened. So I do have quite a bit of time on the target. It's a faint target. The more time you can have, the better. But I have enough, I think, to pull off a pretty good image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pack all this up and put it away and then uh, go home and process this image and show it to you.